Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us today for the first Earth Observation or Water Management Community Practice meeting. Um, today, we're going to be discussing three different perspectives on understanding different types and applications of Earth Observation data. Uh, this meeting today, it will be recorded and made available on demand on the, IWA, uh, on the IWA website. So after this meeting, you will receive a link to this recording as well as the presentations. Below in the chat box, um, you can use this for general requests and for interactive activities like introducing yourself and maybe mentioning your line of work and maybe the sector that you work in. And um, you could also use it to chat with your other, with the, the other meeting attendees, just to see, you know, maybe you, you meet somebody that you've worked with before on a project or so. Next question, next uh, slide, sorry. Um, so just a bit of background about this community of practice. So IWA's work on earth observation for water management is a result of um, successful partnerships and collaborations. We are a part of the consortium of the European project Prime Water, which looks at earth observation technologies for better water management. In Prime Water, IWA is responsible for communication, dissemination, and exploitation of Prime Water products and end users' engagement. Prime Water is also represented in the steering group of this community of practice. We also have uh, an, an memorandum of, of understanding with GeoAcuWatch, which aims to enable water professionals to access and share information on the application of earth observation, of earth observation information and technologies for improved water management. Both IWA and Prime Water are representing in the AcuWatch Steering Committee and Working Group 1, which is focused mainly on outreach and user engagement. Prime Water and AcuWatch also collaborate in promoting their activities within their respective networks. So to give a bit more introduction into this community of practice, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Lars, who is a member of the steering committee, uh, to give you some more background. Thank you very much, Erin, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are. Um, my name is, is Lars Boyer Hansen. I'm, I'm with the international consultancy company uh, DHI. Um, and on behalf of the steering group of this community of practice, I'm very happy to, to, to bid you all welcome to this uh, first meeting. Uh, uh, we have a very exciting uh, agenda ahead of us. Um, right after this introduction, we'll have uh, three presentations. Uh, the first one, um, given by Tapas Biswas will be on development of an EU-based optimal integrated water quality monitoring and forecasting system uh, for inland and coastal waters. That will be followed by a talk on water assessment using earth observation given by Kenneth Mubea. And then lastly, we'll have a presentation by Lisa Maria uh, Rebello on earth observations for sustainable water resource management. After these uh, three presentations, uh, There'll be a, a, a Q&A uh, round, um, and then we'll, we'll break out into, uh, into separate rooms uh, uh, where we can uh, initiate in hopefully uh, a lively discussion uh, and sharing of uh, opinions and, and yeah, continue the, the Q&A session more or less. Followed by that, we will uh, convene again and uh, summarize um, the, the breakout room discussions and then finally close the, close the meeting. So what exactly is this uh, uh, community of practice? Um, it's called Earth Observation Technologies for Water Management. And the overall uh, idea is to, to bring together experts uh, across different sectors uh, with different backgrounds, um, but all sharing a common interest in how we can use earth observation technologies to improve our, our knowledge about water quality and water quantity management. Uh, the CUP is connected to the IWA Digital Water Program also, um, where we have a platform to share experience and, and, and connect with peers uh, 
and, and strengthen the transition on how we can digitize uh, water, water solutions and, uh, and uh, under, under in the, uh, the digital transformation within the water sector. And of course, the, uh, the, the sort of um, hope with these COP is that, uh, well, we can both increase the awareness within IWA, but also beyond uh, IWA on, on all the potential that there lies in using uh, earth observation technology for, for water management. IWA is, is already um, acknowledged with, with the platform for, for a, a, a means of uh, sharing and showcasing uh, ideas and best practices within this. Um, and here we get a, a, a chance to, uh, to engage more and have more focused dialogue on this, uh, on this topic. And specifically for this meeting, uh, the idea is to, to discover, I mean, concrete examples of, uh, of where we are using Earth observation and concrete applications on, on how Earth observation can help us um, in the management of, of our water resources uh, um, across themes and, uh, and domains, really. Um, and of course, this is, uh, it, it gives in the name a uh, community of practice. So we very much hope that you will all uh, take active part in the discussions, uh, uh, both in the, in the breakout rooms, uh, but also in the chat. Uh, this is all about sharing uh, experiences, uh, raising questions, uh, so we can uh, have this uh, lively dialogue. That was the very quick uh, fly-in. Um, and with that, I will be happy to, uh, to pass the word to, to Katrin, who will introduce the three speakers. Hey, great. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, so just I'll introduce myself. I'm Katrin Cross. Um, I, I used to work for IW, IWA, um, <clears throat> uh, leading on the strategic programs, but now work for, for them as a consultant and um, also for a number of other org organizations, including Australian Water Partnership and and IUCN, and it's really exciting to see uh, this community of practice um, evolving and coming to fruition. So it's very exciting to have this meeting today. Um, our first speaker now will be uh, Dr. Kenneth Mobia, who is the User Engagement Manager for Digital Earth Africa uh, establishment team. His role includes technical support and user engagement and support, driving usage of the Digital Earth Africa services and engaging with the Digital Earth Africa network of partners across, across the continent. Um, he sees it, the, that a time has come that Earth observation is um, going to be critical for decision-making for countries and regional bodies in Africa to, towards sustainable management of resources. So, very much looking forward to your presentation, Kenneth, on understanding different types and applications of Earth observation data. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, welcome to this important workshop uh, from Digital Africa is many greetings and also showcasing what is available. Uh, this platform uh, is here for us uh, in the context of Africa, providing almost three terabytes of analysis ready data from open sources, Landsat and Sentinel. And uh, we've been working previously using a pilot program for five countries, uh, which was uh, way back in 2019. And it has grown now into Digital Earth Africa for the whole continent. So with this analysis ready data, I received a request for many countries of what they wanted to see as continental products. Uh, the first one was the water observation from space, which we co-developed with our partners in Africa, from partners in Tunisia, Senegal, Niger, Nigeria, uh, and Southern countries. And this program actually soon will be hosted by the South African Space Agency, just to give the context of our viewers from different parts of the world. So most of the uh, 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 research questions that we are addressing is that of national development agendas, including supporting SDGs, SDG2, and more specifically for this audience, SDG6, in terms of water extent and water quality, and as well represented by my colleague Typers from CSIRO. Uh, so the water observation from space uh, was developed based on that interest, and it's a 30 meter product at the moment, uh, providing way back up to 1980 to see how the content has changed in terms of water variability. And we've had actually very interesting use cases based on the researchers from different parts, especially uh, researchers like uh, from Okavango in Botswana, where I've seen the value 
for example, the Lake Ngami, which has really changed over time. Uh, so this is also similar with what people are seeing across the parts of the world. And this is due to climate change and other parts which are beyond our control. Uh, so more specifically, our use case, which demonstrates the value of this earth observation data for development and in the context of water resources, was some work in Okavango, where we worked with Dr. Kileboge, who's a researcher at the University of Botswana. And uh, she mentioned about some areas where she could not be able to get data for like having historical background, since she's able to do more field work. And uh, she's been talking to the farmers and communities around who tell her stories, which she's not able to quantify. But using earth observation, for example, uh, context of three years, we're able to see quite some change. And even this documentary was recently aired by Al Jazeera in uh, Risking It All, where they were actually showing how farmers have really, uh, the Bushmen have really encountered problems. Uh, the lake at the moment is almost muddy. Then we have periods when like next year in between the year it will be like floods and droughts. So using this to save uh, those decisions and being part of an integrated water management system is what is really impactful for users across the continent and also learning from other parts of the world. So we also have other examples like in Tanzania, where we're looking at Lake Sulunga, uh, it's changes over time, uh, working with the National Bureau of Statistics in Tanzania. And also we worked also with the Regional Center for Mapping and the Kenya Space Agency, providing some context of what happened in Lake Baringo, looking at the water extent, as well as the water quality from the Sentinel-2. So all this is just from open data, uh, showing the value of what we can actually provide to the end users to provide a, a for decision making. So in the context of the same, we were able to provide support for Lake Baringo, where we had to re, uh, rehome the giraffes in the middle of Lake Baringo because of uh, lack of pasture. The lake sometimes dries up, sometimes there are occasional floods. And you can see the context of how we can touch the lives, even of the wildlife in terms of conservation. And this was a very good use case, supporting the conservation agencies uh, in the parts of Africa. And also uh, the material from Digital Africa is available for us to make use, uh, free online resources. And also we run uh, lively sessions every Wednesday uh, to keep uh, uh, in touch with our users from the context of Africa. And we are able to communicate in both English and French so that uh, we leave no one behind in this uh, continent. Thank you so much, our viewers. Thank you very much, Kenneth. And um, yeah, thank you for your... Um your presentation. It gives a good overview of uh, the different possibilities that are available with using Earth observation. Um, so we're now going to move to Tapas, I believe. So Tapas Iswas, um, who is the senior research consultant at uh, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, in Australia. Um, he's been involved with natural resources management, water quality, irrigation and climate change research, consultancy, teaching and policy in Australia and, and overseas for, for more than 33 years. He's also a member of the steering committee of this community of practice. Um, so he's gonna talk about the development of a earth, earth observation based optimal integrated water quality monitoring and forecasting system for inland and coastal waters. So I will hand over you to you Tapas, thank you. My topic today um, aligns very well with the objective of today's meeting. And um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the Australia's uh, First Nation people whose lands and water uh, we do our business and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and uh, emerging. So um, to start the context, you know that um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal requires provision of uh, clean water under a uh, goal six. Management of water resource is a critical issue for uh, all of Australia, um, particularly for its agriculture, environment and communities. Uh, we have a few uh, mega events, uh, for example, fish kills, uh, et cetera, in, um, in our rivers, uh, as well as in uh, coastal areas. Therefore, the water quality impacts um, are of uh, paramount importance. The quantity of available water resources across Australia is monitored through uh, both uh, federal and state programs. However, when it comes to quality, uh, we uh, don't have a single common and comprehensive um, 
state program, a national system uh, that delivers timely systematic information such as early warnings to uh, water agencies, local communities and commercial water users is to help decision makers to better manage ecosystem health, support industry and prevent human or animal health risk. Existing uh, art observation satellites, uh, both the one that are up in the sky or are in the uh, preparation uh, do not um, have the um, requirement, particularly for water quality. This is because the current and the planned satellites designed for either ocean, land or atmosphere application and lack the required spatial, spectral and radiometric as well as temporal resolution. For example, our uh, inland river and um, lakes are um, mainly small and narrow. Hence the need for um, aqua watch um, mission. The goal is to build a comprehensive uh, national system uh, for 24 seven uh, monitoring and forecasting of water quality uh, from sky. And how we'll do that, we'll combine um, in-situ sensor network, satellite data, biohydrologic modeling, and advanced analytics uh, to achieve <clears throat> our mission's goal. Here is a kind of cartoon of the system, of the technology that the AquaWatch Australia mission wants to put together for uh, monitoring both inland and coastal water quality. So starting from denser network of sensor, complementing existing um, network that have been run by the state agencies, we'll be adding additional sensors and then um, we'll use um, IoT kind of things to relay the data. This will then complement it with the customized um, Australian satellites, Aquasat 1 and 2 that you can see um, uh, where my mouse is um, there. The, uh, the whole mission is underpinned by rigorous science and uh, in that space, we have um, sensor technologies working in parallel with the uh, satellite design. Uh, we'll be using uh, in-situ sensor and satellite data integrate them through um, AquaWatch uh, data integration analytic system platform, which has um, got both artificial intelligence and um, spatial analytics platform. And that will help us um, give improved early warning, uh, remote quantification of species, which is not possible by any satellite uh, at this moment of time and other water quality parameters, for example, black water, turbidity, um, et cetera. So here is an example of an in-situ camera that uh, CSIRO, my agency organization, have developed. And this uh, camera uh, has um, high resolution spectral signature, take um, reading at every 15 minutes time, so real-time data. And that, when analyzed properly, can give you idea of suspended solids, chlorophyll, um, cyanobacterial pigments, and uh, dissolved organic carbon. However, to analyze, we need long-term deployment to relate in-lake water quality parameters to the spectral resolution. And then the unique thing in this mission is calibration of the satellite data with real-time in-situ uh, high resolution uh, uh, time series uh, data that you will be collecting using on-ground sensor. So the um, total machine is um, kind of the central one, which is the uh, ADS sort of thing that takes into data from both in-situ and satellite, and then churn it with the models. And then at the end of the day, it gives you um, algal forecast, both for um, uh, alert level as well as um, early uh, warning. Here is an example of Lake Hume, but I have taken the turbidity as an example. However, we can do the same thing for blue green algae. Now, nothing is um, uh, important uh, to do research without having uh, 
proper collaborators and stakeholders. Here is an example. Um, uh, we have uh, stakeholders and our collaborators at our field site, um, Lake Tagano in uh, Canberra, uh, Australia. So the benefits are uh, triple bottom line, and you can see um, once the system is in operational, it will give us uh, economic, environmental, and social benefit in due course of time. So far over a year, uh, we have spent in developing um, good understanding of user communities, and today is one of them uh, for uh, the system. Uh, here is a list of potential uh, customers. You can see um, it's spread from local, state, national water agency to all the way to tourism and fisheries um, sector because it will cover a number of spectral characteristics. Um, this could not only uh, be used for um, water quality operation uh, uh, for recreation, but also uh, over a variety uh, of parties, those are uh, interested uh, um, in this um, water quality monitoring. Of course, uh, it will also help grow Australian space industry, including new business on satellite manufacturing, IoT, ground station, data processing, and so on and so forth. So uh, where are we uh, today in terms of mission roadmap? The mission itself is at its very early stage. And you can see the red dot, um, red circle where we are today. Um, it is scheduled for official launch this year, middle of this year. Um, and we're hoping uh, in June, part of the plan is now to build number of test sites to, to test the whole system. Um, and on the top of the arrow and at the bottom of the arrow, you can see list of pilot projects uh, that we will be uh, building uh, very soon. Some of are already built and some will be built um, sooner. Bottom arrow is all about the satellite precursor. So there will be first satellite that will go uh, 2028, AquaSat 1 followed by Aquaset 2 and then Aquaset 3. Here is the um, uh, list of those pilots, uh, domestic one, Australian one. We're working closely with a number of agencies and they have different need for this um, monitoring. And you can see here on the right map uh, how they are spaced across the whole uh, continent. Similarly, um, here are the international pilot projects, both ongoing and upcoming. And you can see they are mostly in Asia and America where algal blooms are a common nuisance. Uh, well, we are working with a fairly large number of parties um, and I uh, acknowledge them. I also acknowledge um, um, IWA uh, for having me uh, today here. And with this, uh, I thank you and conclude my talk. Thank you very much, Tapas, and it's uh, very interesting to see how um, how this uh, these approaches are evolving and how they're um, going to put, plan to be used in, in different places across the world. Um, so looking forward to, to learning more during the discussion. So our next, um, I'll move on to our next presentation. Um, so our speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Maria Rebello, who is a Principal Scientist in Earth Observation at the International Water Management Institute, IMI, uh, with 20 years of research experience across Africa and Asia, focusing on the provision of spatial information, metrics, and indicators to inform land and water management strategies. Um, Lisa is also the Vice Chair of the Scientific and Technical Review Panel for the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands and coordinator of the wetland theme of the Japanese Aerospace Ex Exploration Agency's Kyoto and Carbon Initiative. Um, so she's going to be talking about Earth Observations for Sustainable Water Resources Management. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Catherine. So um, the research that the team um, and I undertake at IMI focuses very much on addressing key water-related information gaps um, that can be assessed through the, year, through the use of a variety of Earth Observation data. 
and we work across Africa, um, the MENA region and Asia, but I'm going to focus today on an application um, which we're developing across the African continent, um, which builds very much on um, the presentation um, of Kenneth and the Digital Earth Africa um, resource. So while there is a huge variability um, in the water related issues across the continent, there are a few broadly shared challenges that need better data. And these are summarized here um, on, on the slide that, that you can see. And so our focus is on a few critical underlying challenges um, that are essential to socioeconomic development and resilience across the continent uh, that are widespread. So they affect multiple countries um, where there are significant data gaps um, and in particular data gaps which can be addressed through the use of earth observation data and which would benefit from regional or larger scale approaches. So these are broadly summarized on the left. So we have um, water scarcity, um, insufficient water to meet uh, growing and changing needs. We have variability where natural variation is being exacerbated by climate change and other development related challenges. We have water quality issues uh, where water quality is degrading. And then we have productivity issues um, where we need to look at how uh, we can get more from the available water. And against all of this, uh, looking at the larger scale and, and at water resources, we obviously have the challenge uh, that, that um, water resources uh, are often transboundary in nature, so they cut across uh, international borders. So this makes it even more challenging uh, to address some of these issues due to this transboundary nature. But this is really where Earth observation has a huge potential as unlike the um, in situ and hydromet data, availability, accessibility, and quality are not defined by international borders, by national borders, sorry. Next slide, please. So with this in mind, IMI has been working over the past few years with our partners to develop an earth observation-based water accounting framework and application. And this is what um, you have summarized on the slide in front of you. So this is very much an integrative approach, taking many different data sources um, and trying to put them all together to look at essentially producing uh, what we refer to as water accounts. So water accounts can be thought of um, similar to a financial account. We're trying to summarize uh, what's coming into the system and what are the resources that are coming into the system. Um, how are they being used uh, once they're in that system? So in this case, within a river basin, who are the main users and how much is left um, on, an, on a certain accounting basis within that domain? So we address this through those three main components that you can see. We look at how to integrate data um, from Earth observation satellites. Um, we then uh, put this through uh, various modeling frameworks. And finally, we output a series of uh, water accounts, which summarize a higher level of indicators related to water use, uh, water availability, um, or water uh, that's available for further use uh, within that spatial domain. So in this case, say a river basin. Um, next slide, please. So looking in a bit more detail at the process, um, if we start on the right hand side, um, the approach we, we're, we're um, doing here, it's, it's very demand driven. So we start with the areas where we have requests for information, the types of decisions where we know we can influence uh, through the use of Earth observation, where there are currently gaps um, and where we know the data uh, will be of benefit. So these are related to, for example, um, the water data, uh, the water data system. So if you think about your river basin, it's essentially your water balance, how much water is there in the system. This, uh, the second one related to water allocation issues. Um, how do we identify how much water is available for further use and how do we do that in a sustainable way? Um, so looking at how much water there is, how much is being used, including by the environment for environmental flows, how much is committed to downstream uses, which enables us to look at that broader water allocation um, aspect. For investment planning, if in a particular basin we're looking at a, a large scale irrigation investment or a dam or a reservoir, what are the implications likely to be? And finally, on system level water productivity. 
Um, so when we look at the system as a whole, how do changes in use and availability of water in one place affect productivity in another place? So bearing in mind those four application and those four areas of questions and applications, which link, of course, back to the ones we looked at initially around variability, scarcity, productivity and quality, um, we've then defined the, the, this water accounting system. So on the left, you have the data inputs. And this, this is just a selection. We use between 20 and 30 different um, data sets as inputs from uh, global databases. So we have a series of earth observation based data linked to the water flows and fluxes. And there are the obvious ones, the precipitation, uh, soil moisture, derived ones, evapotranspiration, the base flow to runoff ratio, but then also linked to quality grey water consumption, as well as to uh, large scale groundwater changes. We also have a series of data sets, uh, which are key inputs, um, which are related to the landscape conditions, because the key aspect of this approach is that we're looking at, the, at water use across the entire landscape. Um, so that's related to the vegetation, um, for example, but also then to environmental flows, so the sustainability of the system. Um, and coming back to the point I made earlier, um, the key thing about this approach is that because we're using global databases, um, this is, we're using the same input data for every location. So it doesn't change across international borders, which means we can, uh, we can apply the same approach and derive the same indicators on a regular and consistent basis um, for every location that we're working. Whereas traditionally, when we look at um, other water accounting approaches based on national level statistics or hydrological models, you, you can, you're constrained um, across borders. So these data are integrated into the middle sections, which is the analysis and modeling framework. And this is open source. All of the data are open access. The, the, all of the modeling tools are open source. And currently, we're building it in parallel to the Digital Earth Africa um, framework and architecture on Amazon Web Services hosted in Cape Town. So everything is publicly available there. And then we have a series of outputs, um, some of which are statistical, some of which are the indicators. These are produced on a seasonal and an annual basis and summarized uh, through a series of water accounts. Next slide, please. But because um, the data are spatial, even though the water accounts are summarized uh, for a basin or sub-basin or a catchment on an annual and seasonal scale, we can also view the data spatially. So we derive pixel-based water balance across the entire landscape. So this is just to give you an example um, for a particular um, use case, um, a, a bit one particular river, uh, river basin. Where what we have on the left is a summary of the mean annual water balance, and on the right, we have a summary of the mean dry season, the key parameters, um, key water balance parameters. So if you look on the left, we have uh, summarized um, the amount of rainfall that's entering the system. That's the blue arrow, the P. So you can see what's coming in in terms of the volume. And on the bottom left, you have the outflow, so what leaves the system. And then in between, we, we can look at how much water is actually being consumed, how much of that water that comes in is being used, and we partition that into the source of the water. So whether that's uh, blue water sources, so from rain, from um, rain, sorry, from um, surface water, or if, is it um, from additional water sources, an incremental source of water. So we split it into green and blue um, evapor evaporation processes. So that enables us to look at where the irrigation, what's being consumed through processes such as irrigation, what's being consumed through, for example, landscape processes. And then we do on the same on the right for the dry season. This is an annual dry season. Um, sorry, I should have said over a 10 year period. So both of these mean annual and mean dry season over a 10 year period, um, the recent 10 years, 2010 to 2021. And so that enables you to look at um, what are the average conditions in, in the dry season as well. And then I have two parameters on the slide um, which go one step further and are taken from the water accounts, which is the total available um, resource. So what is actually available for use within the basin? Um, and what is utilizable? So that utilizable parameter is a very important one in the water accounts because what it refers to is the quantity, the volume of water which is available for further use once we've taken into account all of the existing uses within the basin and the environmental flows and any downstream commitments. So that utilizable um, indicator shows you how much water is available for further application, further allocation, further development, 
um, within the basin. So you can see for this particular basin, you would have there's a small portion available on average on an annual basis, and an even small, even smaller portion during the dry season. So in terms of looking at sustainable development strategies around groundwater resources management, um, something needs to change um, for this particular basin. So I think that's it for my slides. I just want to finish by saying where we're going next with this process is looking at how to move from that single basin case study to making it more operational. And we're doing that by building on existing platforms such as Digital Earth Africa, where we can ingest data, data sources from different locations along with the analysis ready data that already exists and build this at the continental scale so that we can provide this level of information and the water accounts for anywhere um, on the African continent. So I'll stop there and turn back to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Lisa. It was uh, really interesting to see how this um, this can be applied, and um, I can see how the visualization and the information would be um, essential and very useful for for basin planning processes, as as you mentioned, especially at the transboundary level. Um, so we have a um, a few questions, and and please continue to to put your your questions in the chat. So the first question. Um, we have is for Tapas from Arjun. Um, he's asking, can this technology indicate precise levels of organic and inorganic contaminants at micrograms per liter? And does it identify any microbial contaminants, contaminants or, re, or is it restricted to only a few? So Tapas, would you be able to answer that question? Uh, yes, I did put that on the chat itself, uh, uh, Catherine, but, um, but for, um, for um, those who haven't had a chance to read. Uh, so the system that I have um, presented um, at the moment is um, um, able to detect uh, dissolved organic carbon, um, cyanobacteria, and we are uh, thinking of including um, uh, species. Um, so that is uh, kind of in the, in the visible uh, world, but um, um, we are also in CSRO working with sensor technology. Uh, there's a group working uh, with um, dissolved um, constituents, but they are for the future. Hey, th thank you very much for that response. Um, so we have a, a, a couple more questions. I, I realize that, uh, yeah, so there's one that um, was asked to, to Kenneth, and I, I realize that you did answer it in the chat, but maybe so everyone else can um, hear it. Uh, the, the question is, what kind of data is being, uh, is Dr. Mufundizi collecting in the Okavango? Because um, there is a struggle in getting um, ecological aquatic health um, historical data in this area. So. Um, can you give some insights into the type of data that is being collected there? Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, so the platform providing earth observation means also the end user is collecting some in situ data for validation. For example, we are looking at the water levels at different times uh, based on what was presented as a product for them, showing the analysis over time. I also interviewing the farmers around the region, uh, what has happened and also collaborating with the Botswana Meteorological Agency. So it's quite a collaboration of end user and the champions on the ground. And I know there's a challenge of uh, people sharing data and also people working in silos. And uh, it's a great opportunity to be part of this important workshop to see how we can work together closely. Thank you. Great, thank you very much for that response. So um, we have another question for Lisa. Um, on data storage and how is this analyzed? Um, so from my understanding of this question, it, it's asking um, basically how are you, uh, how are you undergoing data cleaning, filtering and targeting the appropriate data and how are, how are you able to do this in um, the time in, in very quick um, timescales? Thanks, Catherine. Um, so, all of the data that we use comes from existing global data sets and databases, which are, all, which are all already in analysis ready data formats. So they've already been cleaned, they've already been filtered, 
um, those are the thematic products in that list that I showed. They've already been um, validated. They have a level of uncertainty associated with them. So that's the, the attractiveness of, of the approach is that we're integrating from existing analysis ready or thematic data sets. So we do not undertake the cleaning and, and filtering um, that you mentioned. Um, what we do need to do, however, is bias correction. Um, and calibration for things like the precipitation data, which will vary um, from location to location because it's quite context specific. So for certain key data sets where we know that there are landscape variabilities, we do do bias correction and validation. We also integrate um, outflows uh, for each basin that we work, and that's what enables us to assign the uncertainty uh, in our water balance parameters at the basin scale. Um, but the, 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 yeah, your, your points on, um, on the filtering um, and the cleaning, yeah, are luckily not, not an issue for us in this approach. In terms of the storage, we don't, I'm not sure what the reference to the milliseconds is, but we produce annual accounts. Um, so it's processed over a year. Um, it's not near real time data because you don't do that for the water accounts. You produce a water account at the end of the calendar year and as well the seasonal um, water accounts because you close the water balance once uh, the, the season has, has finished and you want to look at the changes in storage over that entire accounting period. So yeah, for us, it's, it's, not, an, it's not a case of instantaneous um, computations. Um, one point though related to that is we're able to, 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 um, to process these really large amounts of data um, because we're using Amazon Web Services um, and cloud-based processing. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so I also have a few more questions. Um, so perhaps at least another question for you is um, just following on what you were saying, how, how can we ensure increased um, acceptance of, the, of Earth observation data? Um, it's obviously, evolved considerably in the past few years, but sometimes there is um, questions about uncertainty and reliability. Um, what, what strategies do you have in place for that? Thanks, Catherine. I think this is a really important question, um, because like you say, over the past few years, um, our access to the type of data um, that's available from Earth observation satellites, particularly uh, within um, water cycle science, has really changed and revolutionized what we can do with it. And levels of uncertainty have become increasingly more acceptable. Um, but there is always um, a, a certain mistrust or just not the understanding of what those certainties are don't exist outside of the community. And it's really important when we present the approach to our users that we're very transparent and, and clear about what the data can be used for and what it can't be used for. So um, for example, with this type of approach, we're very clear it's applicable to establish baselines at the basin scale or the sub-basin scale, not at a small catchment scale, because the uncertainties um, outweigh the benefits that you would get for decision-making at that, at that level. So to me, it's really about being transparent about the scale of, of application and use. Um, but also um, somewhat against that is for many of the basins in which we work, which are ungaged basins, no information is available. So even with large levels of uncertainty, we're still able to constrain some of the decision making with this type of analysis. So even though we always need to be cognizant of the levels of uncertainty that come with the use of the Earth observation data and be very transparent and clear about those from the start, I think we also need to bear in mind that for many places, particularly where we work, um, even with large levels of uncertainty, it still helps um, with decision making in the absence of any other data. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that response. Yeah, I think that's very important. It's, it's opened up many opportunities for places that have don't have much access to data. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, we have a question on um, census that um, <clears throat> Tapos will answer which is looking is asking about um, calibration and how they have to be uh, customized. So Tapas, perhaps you can answer that question. Thank you, Catherine and, and Arjun. Uh, this is one of the <clears throat> um, 
question that we're trying to address in our uh, project. And I do fully agree uh, that the um, water in Northern Hemisphere is different than the water we have in Southern Hemisphere in Australia. Also, um, absolutely correct, uh, geographically, um, you know, the amount of um, suspended colloids, for example, for us, it is the um, aluminosilicates uh, from very old continent. Um, most of the rivers in the Mare Darling Basin, they have this murky water throughout the year, not as you see in um, Amazon or probably Nile River. So you are right. And for this particular reason, many um, satellite um, based uh, art observation data that people are trying to uh, promote or sell. Um, and I mentioned there are a number of companies that are trying to say, oh, I can tell you um, uh, what is the uh, current status of uh, blue green algae, uh, for example, and how they're going to look in, in future. Many of them, I believe, uh, please correct me, those who are um, uh, present here, are not properly calibrated. And this is what I think this mission, Australia Coach mission, is, um, is, is, is trying to do is to um, set up pilot uh, uh, projects. And I have shared that in my presentations uh, throughout um, the world, not, not Europe. Um, I don't think algae is a big problem there. So we would like to ground truth our above water sensor. And then we would like to calibrate the satellite. And hence, you are right, it will be geographical based calibration algorithm that we'll be using. Of course, we won't be um, able to do each and every water bodies, if that makes sense. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, we don't have any time. I'm gonna ask one final question to Kenneth, but then we need to move on. Um, we're gonna have a breakout room, so there'll be lots of chance to discuss in more detail. But final question for you, Kenneth, is um, so how do you see Earth, observ Earth observation information um, being used to support development in the context of water resources, um, especially at the local level? Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. As Alia alluded to, is that the platform is quite big and not most people are aware about it. And the few people who know it are our champions. So for example, in uh, Tanzania, uh, we are working with the National Bureau of Statistics, a person who has uh, an, an observation background and is trying to support the SDG process. And they went to a specific leg to show how this can actually be impactful. And uh, such people are the ones who are able to put it in their national development agenda as a tool which can be used the other example of Okavango was uh, working with the University of Botswana person to help policymakers to develop an integrated watershed uh, plan. So as much as we have the earth observation, it's for us to engage with the policymakers as well as the scientists who are between us and the policymakers to make it very easy for them to see this platform is not a threat, but it's a useful tool for them to use and integrate. And also uh, we preserve the resources for sustainable development. For example, if some of these lakes are not uh, looked after, they would be drying up as we had the case, uh, some parts of uh, Lake Chad. So Lake Chad, we are looking at it uh, using our colleagues in agreement in Niger who are looking at four countries Countries, and this is a matter of ECOWAS. So it's quite a process and it's a dialogue and uh, we are grateful for this uh, first COP meeting and looking forward to many, many more. Great, thank you very much. And a uh, key point there that we can use earth observation data as part of the dialogue to figure out how better to manage our water resources. So I'll hand back to Erin and we'll move to the breakout rooms. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you to all the speakers for such um, insightful <clears throat> presentations, as well as the question and answer. So now we will have the opportunity to discuss in a smaller format and um, get some more, um, you know, discussion flowing. Um, we will now randomly place you in breakout rooms uh, where we will be able to um, discuss two main things. Um, our speakers will be moderators as well as we will have rapporteurs there just making notes of, of, of um, the main points of our discussion. In the first part of the breakout room, we would like you our attendees to share with us the moderators and rapporteurs just about your experiences 
and um, experiences on projects and initiatives related to today's topic. So anything that um, you could relate to from the presentations that you saw or um, something that you didn't see mentioned today and, and that you think is important to also be mentioned. And in the second part, um, we would like to hear from you um, your thoughts about this community of practice and um, just about how you think you can participate. So um, just without any further discussion, maybe we could um, already start the breakout rooms. Okay, so let's continue. Um, at this time, we will ask the moderators from the breakout room sessions to just give a short recap, um, just, just to, you know, summarize what was discussed in in each breakout room so uh tapas would you like to go first sure um would you like to wait for all to join or you have everyone in the room now get all back again tapas okay wonderful so um we had a um spectrum of uh, um, discussions and there are um, six, seven, including Nabila in our group and had a um, wide variety of uh, experiences that they shared um, with us. Um, there are a few things that um, uh, of highlight uh, and, and they are, for example, um, in terms of um, art observation data, we need to be mindful that we don't claim um, that all data, um, quote, um, analysis ready, unquote. Um, because uh, because um, for water quality particularly, many data uh, may not be ground truth. So ground truth came also into the conversation, ground truth. And I think it's very important. And one of the participants have mentioned that very clearly. Um, so second one is uh, about um, advantage of art observation, which universally um, accepted that it can um, give you uh, information for those countries who do not have a good set of uh, information um, and, and, and particularly for water resources, you can have them uh, from the sky, even though the country doesn't have uh, good um, ground data. So it, it, is, it is kind of a good tool that was discussed. And in the um, background of climate change, um, water security sort of things, um, that art observation will play um, a greater role. The um, other conversation was um, about um, conflict, um, international water conflicts. Uh, where a um, particular country doesn't want to provide data um, okay. for, for, for you sort of thing. So these are the things that were discussed and also um, uh, application of uh, art observation for um, town water planning, um, wastewater um, management, um, water resources management, um, sort of things came up. Uh, okay. Thank you. Sounds like a nice discussion. Uh, Kenneth? Uh, thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, for us, it was more of uh, the group met for the first time and they were so excited to know what everyone is doing. So there was a question of uh, what else is there that IWA can make possible, like, uh, like a knowledge base uh, where we can actually know where everyone is or what everyone is doing. So we had uh, persons from ground station space uh, in the Netherlands who are doing quite uh, useful stuff and also they were looking at uh, various programs uh, working with Copenicas and some of the projects that they're doing and how they can actually connect with more persons in this uh, webinar uh, like opportunities which are there. Uh, then we had a colleague from uh, South Africa working in actually a water quality department whom they might lack data so sometimes they have to go physically to the ground to collect data so those are the pains and points of getting the data versus what they can use from the space. So the support they can get from, like in the context where she is, you can get the support from South Africa Space Agency to get uh, an assessment of some of these areas whom we are supporting through Digital Earth Africa. 
and also uh, partners like CNS are developing some new tools and projects. Uh, so the new tools can be very useful to inform uh, water quality and also what libraries are there which are open source. So these are some of the questions which were there. Uh, so like I've posted the information about the ground space, uh, then uh, uh, opportunities for moving forward. There were suggestions about uh, incorporating uh, uh, these uh, technical and commercial specification in terms of uh, procurement. Uh, it was quite an issue discussed. Then a call to action is how to connect the work we do with policy makers. Uh, how are we communicating with them? Uh, we're very technical with the 50 PowerPoint slides or a uh, thousand manuscripts, or is it possible to have policy briefs which can really inform uh, policy? And how uh, are we able to work with the, the people on the ground in terms of citizen science, impact stories, and also moving forward uh, opportunities for frequent meetings, maybe mm -hmm. so that we can actually have more information. Perhaps some of the persons wanted to be in this uh, group breakout soon, breakout group, they were not able to actually connect more. So the ball is yours, IWA. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth. And uh, Lisa, Lisa Maria. Thanks, Erin. So we only had um, two participants in um, in our meeting room, in addition to the moderator and rapporteur. So I'll just summarize very briefly two key highlights of the discussion. Um, and one was really around the challenges um, that we still face in use, using Earth observation data within um, the water sector. And one aspect of that was still in, in particular in relation to water quality assessments, the need for a lot of in situ and climatic variables. And I think it's a really important point um, that sometimes gets, gets a bit lost is that we are still for some applications very much dependent on the amount and quality of the in situ data. Um, and that some applications are still very much context specific, but then related to that also came how we can, through the community of practice, um, bring together um, people working in different locations on the same issues who have access to different sets of data, um, and either through data sharing or experience sharing, um, yeah, work together on, on similar thematic areas. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. And uh, Eunice? Yeah, so we were in breakout four and I was with Erin. I think we had a really nice discussion there. I think we had about seven participants from different um, countries. And I think that really the take home message from our group was that the fact that um, everyone is kind of on a different um, level in terms of their journey from moving from traditional monitoring water quality to earth observation or 4IR or artificial intelligence, whatever you'd like to brand it as. So it was nice for us to then share the kinds of um, challenges that we are facing as we are um, trying to move more to earth observation for our water quality monitoring. I think um, Arjun brought up a nice um, topic around data management, which is not only for earth observation, but it's for a lot of the water work that we're doing. What do we do with the data? How do we clean it up effectively? You know, what do we delete? But then at the same time, we had Jordi from Spain, who have been doing a lot of traditional monitoring. They have years and years of data. And does that make it easier then to leapfrog into using earth observation technology? So there was a really nice discussion around data um, management and also just encouraging each other in terms of what we can take from each other to make sure then that our, we're not repeating the same mistakes that other groups have made as they move from um, your traditional monitoring more to your um, earth observation. Then there are also, um, in terms of projects that are starting, I know um, Aziza from Finland, she mentioned the fact that they are developing an app in South Africa too. We also have a, a Sinolakes app that looks at eutrophication at our different dams. So I think maybe IWA has to find a way to collate some of these kinds of um, technologies that are coming up that people can try on their own, you know, or maybe use it in their utilities as well. And I think also there was a little bit of, it didn't come out clearly, but a little bit of differences in terms of challenges around what utilities will face and what um, people are focusing on when it comes to research and academia. So you do find that the research and academia is a little bit ahead, whilst utilities, we're still trying to drag them along to, to, um, to use some of the stuff that we verified during our, our research processes. Yeah, I think, Erin, that's the sum of it. I don't know whether you have any addition. <laughs> I think you handled it very well. Um, right. Thank you very much, Eunice. And um, just to close, I will hand over to Catherine to sum it up. Um, 
as best as she can. Catherine? Okay, thank you, Erin, and thank you everyone for participating today. Um, I, I think it was a really good discussion. i um, also like to thank the speakers for um, providing your perspectives and setting the scene. Um, I think is a good base for future discussions. Um, I think the point um, that we heard about sharing our journeys of monitoring, forecasting, um, in, uh, in, in a water management context could be, you know, for different uses and how earth observation has been part of that is, is important to, to really learn from each other. Um, I think secondly, the point about understanding the challenges uh, that are being faced um, and um, how in-situ data um, can work together with earth observation data. Then thirdly, I thought there was a very good point about connecting this with policymakers. Um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of uh, laws that are in, in different parts of the world, um, water resource laws that are being under reform. And um, there's an opportunity to integrate um, this type of, uh, these types of approaches in, in the, these amendments and also bring this to the notice of policymakers. Um, and then finally, yeah, the need for a knowledge base. Um, IWA is a good platform to share information. Um, so we encourage you all to join, if you have not already, the community of practice, uh, which is on IWA Connect, and put forth your ideas um, for, for future discussions or future outputs that the community of practice can facilitate and get in touch with Erin and Samuela, and um, they, they would be happy to, to um, yeah, put together your ideas for, for future events and, and um, for the conversation. So um, I think I will wrap up there. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation today and hope to talk to you all again in the future. Um, so thank you. <laughs>